Okay, so we're gonna start from the beginning. I was wondering, what are your parents' names? My father's name was Agustin Reyes. And your mother's name? Margarita Reyes. Where were they born? My father was born in uh, Mexico, Mexico City in Aguascalientes, Mexico. And how did they get to Arizona? My father wa walked across uh, uh, Texas, uh, where they're having that big controversy right now in Texas. Uh, he crossed the Rio Grande, and he crossed with my aunt, but he claimed it was his wife. So they both crossed, walked across, both of them crossed walking, and then my dad came to uh, Arizona. He became, he became, worked for the railroad, and uh, he was a carpenter. He built houses, how built houses, until he got hurt, and then he couldn't work no more. He had to retire at a very young age. So that was my dad. My mother, they said she was born in uh, Chino Valley first, Chino Valley, Arizona. But then they told me, no, she wasn't born in Chino Valley. She was born in Humboldt, Arizona. So I never really, really knew where my mother was born. I just go by Humboldt now. And she was a, a Mexican cook. She worked for that El Charles restaurant 30 years until she got sick. Very sick. She worked for Canarios. I mean, Canarios Cafe. She hated Mexican food because that's what she made. So she wouldn't eat all day. All she did was drink Coke, Coke, Coke. And she got sick. And they said, well, she died of cirrhosis of the liver. And they said it was, did she drink? No. Did she smoke? No. It was just a Coke that she got her liver messed up with Coke. And then she died. I did not see her either before she died. My father, I was in China. And China to Prescott, Arizona is a long, long ways. So they didn't even want to send me back to the funeral. The Red Cross says, yes, you are. You're going to send him back. So they flew me back from China, San Francisco, Phoenix, and then I got a ride from Phoenix to Prescott. They were burying my dad that day. I barely got to see the funeral of his coffin, but I never saw my father again. And what war did you serve in? What's that? What war were you in? The no, I was not in the uh, war. I was right at the end of the Korean War. That's all I did. Uh, but I was on a ship, and we patrolled the whole Pacific Ocean, all the way from... Pearl Harbor, all the way to China, back and forth, back and forth. So that's uh, what I did. But, well, it was, I enjoy being in the Navy. It was nice. I saw a lot, a lot of countries, Japan, uh, the Philippines. I, I saw all those countries, real nice. What I liked about the Philippines was the Philippines, when we go there, it was just like being in Mexico. Mexican food, mariachis, music, you know, and it was just nice. You know, we had to eat mostly American food aboard ship. So we could not go into a restaurant, like especially in, in Japan, China. They tell you, you are off limits when you go in China to eat in a restaurant. And so when and where were you born? I was born here in Prescott, Arizona. And what's the year? I was born on January the 1st, 1938. I was, yesterday was my birthday. Oh. So I grew up here and I went to a kindergarten at this school. They closed down on uh, Gurley, it's Washington School. And I stayed there till I guess about second grade or towards the end of second grade. 
and then they moved us to, uh, they were building our school, which is called Mata E. Dexter School. But while they were building Mata E. Dexter School, we had, they had to send us to the, the rodeo grounds, which is called now, but it was called the foreground. Uh, that's when we went up there and, and where they have the rodeos, horse races and everything. And uh, then they had the exhibit, Yavapai County Fair. So they'd send us over there in one of them buildings for our schooling until they built us, our school. So they finished and then they sent us back to Dexter School at third grade. And I stayed there until the sixth grade. And then they sent us to uh, Prescott Junior High, which is called Prescott Junior High. Now it's called uh, the Sheriff Department on Gertie Street. And, uh, and I went to Phoenix three different times. Back then I had a little cross here. And that, they used to say that was a mark of Pachucos, especially in California. Back then the Pachucos and the service guy did not get along with each other. So told me, you can't. We, they tell me, you didn't make it. On the third, before the third time, this officer told me, he said, you really want to join the service? Yes, sir. He said, I'll tell you what, you go back and tattoo over that cross and then come back and then you'll pass. So I did. So I came, went back and I passed it right away. So they sent me to Los Angeles to the final test over there. So I went over there. There was Army, Marines, Air Force, and all that, doors. And they said Navy door was locked. I kept, you had to be there at 0700. Go over there, it's locked. Eight o'clock, locked. Nine o'clock, locked. Finally, I said, why is everybody going in the Marines? I'm not going into the Marines. So I went in there, and from that on, they yell at you, yell at you, cuss at you. They say, you idiot, you should have known better that you saw everybody coming in here. Why didn't you come in here and ask them? I said, well, I'm going into the Navy. I didn't know I had to go up through the Marines. They told me to go in there, that room. I sat down and said, okay, that's it. Go to another room. They took all of us to another room. Raise your right hand. They start swearing us in. Okay. Now, what they call us swabbies, say the swabby, you're a swabby, okay? You are now a swabby. You are now in the hands of the United States government. You are a Navy man. Oh, I was happy. I said, oh, I'm glad, I'm happy. So then they sent us uh, in a, a train to San Diego over there for my basic training. So I spent there, I believe, 16 weeks. They train you all kinds of things. So finally we graduated. And they sent, gave me 15 days to go come to Prescott. Well, when I came back, my mother and my father, of course, were heartbroken because I had gotten into the Navy. I said, oh, it'll be all right, Mom. It'll be all right, Dad. My mother was younger than my dad. I'll be all right, don't worry about it. So, I said, well, I hope so. Where are you going to? I don't know. I don't know where my ship's at. It's out at sea somewhere. So my dad was older. He said, come here, mijo, come here. You kneel right here in front of me. I said, well, what for, Dad? And I don't know if you know anything about... Uh, La bendición. That's what I'm going to do. So he la bendición. Made the cross. He said, in Spanish, he said, son, you'll never see me alive again. Oh, dad, don't say that. Don't say that. No, you'll never see me again. I said, oh, yes, I will. So then I took off, and I never did see him again. He died... Uh, before they even brought me back.
But uh, I had a big deal of four years in the Navy that I really enjoyed. So a lot of beautiful country. So I liked it. And when did you meet your wife? My wife was from Clarkdale. So they were sitting in the living room and uh, my mother had my picture of uh, my Navy uniform. And she told uh, my sister, who's that guy in that u Navy uniform? She said, oh, you don't know him? No. Well, that's my brother. That's my brother Charlie. And uh, she said, uh, uh, her name was Ruth. They called her Kuka. She said, uh, you know what, Terry, my sister named Terry. She said, you know what, Terry, I'm going to tell you something. You see your brother there? I'm going to marry him. Oh, you are? You really think you are? Yes, I do. Well, she grew up. She started growing up. And uh, by that time, I was already a civilian. And I started working at the Iron King Mine. So I really, really met her. I went on an Easter Sunday to Cottonwood, Clarkdale. And they had a big Easter barbecue over there. So that's where I really met her. And she kept eyeing on me. And I, I knew she kept eyeing me, but I pretend I wasn't even looking at her. So finally she got the nerve to come and talk to me and shook my hand and she said, you know who I am? I, I said, well, yeah, I think I do. She said, well, I'm Cooker. Oh, I said, well, I'm Charlie. So then we kept going around. I kept working at the mine, having a big ball, making good money. And we, I kept going down there. And she asked me, we started going around with each other, dating more and more. Went to the drive-in, and my brother and his wife, me and Kuka. So then we started making plans to get married. And we had a big, big wedding. And we, uh, after we got married, we, I brought it to Prescott to live with me because I was working at the Iron Key Mine. So she wasn't pregnant. So a year later, my oldest daughter was born. And then after that, one after another, four kids I had. Charlie was the second. And then it was uh, his brother Johnny and then my youngest daughter, Anna. So she started working at the hospital yeah, Pi Regional Hospital as a nurse there. She started as an aide, and then she worked her way up. And uh, she worked there 30 years, I believe, until she got stomach cancer. And she cared more for her patients than she did for herself until I realized she was real sick. I said, you're going to see the doctor now. I'm taking you. I'm forcing you. So I took her to this surgeon, and he told me, you know, Mr. Reyes, I'm going to tell you right now, it doesn't look good, what she's been telling us. She kept saying that whatever she ate, whatever she drank, it felt like it was floating in her stomach. And that's why that doctor said, it doesn't look good. He said, I'm going to open her up and uh, see what I find. But you better have your family ready there because... Uh, it doesn't look good. You better bring your priest. Okay. So she told me, honey, you better tell me the truth. If they see that I have cancer, you better tell me I have cancer. And she told the doctor the same thing. He said, okay, I'll tell her. So they opened it up. As soon as they rolled her out of the surgery, she was awake already. I said, how can she be awake already when she's just coming out of surgery? I thought she'd still be asleep from the anesthesia, whatever they give her. Right away, she, when she saw me, she said, Honey, what they find in me? I already knew. I was just being tough, not to cry or anything. So I said, You know, the doctor and I haven't really got together. And he said, He'll get with me in about 10 minutes. I said, You better tell me the truth, I will. 
So I went downstairs where my, do uh, my kids were, and we took them up there, and right away I told them. Well, they all started crying. I said, you know, you got to be tough. Don't be crying, yelling, and all this. Oh, we won't. So we went up there to the room which she, she was at, a recovery room, and the, she asked the doctor right away, Doc, what did you find? He said, Ruth, I'm going to tell you the truth. It doesn't look good. You have cancer. And uh, so I asked him, Doctor, how long does she have to live? He said, six months. I said, oh, yeah, six months, yes. I said, if not anymore, well, maybe, but six months. I gave her six months to live. She lived nine months, and I had to treat her. So she lived uh, 19, nine months, and she asked me, she said, uh, she was in the hospital before that. She said, honey, if it's okay with you, can I go home and die at home? I said, you can do whatever you want. It's your house, too. She said, okay, I want to go home and die. Okay. So we took her home, and she died there in bed. I was in bed with her about five in the morning, and she died about 5.30 in the morning. And I called my daughters who were still in the other bedrooms. I said, you better come in here because I think it's time for your mother to go. So they came in and well, they knew that she was going. And two minutes, she was gone. And you know, from the time they told her that she had cancer, nine months, she never cried. Not a tear, never, never cried. She'd tell everybody, if I'm ready to go, the dear Lord wants me, I am ready to go. So she uh, worked at the hospital for 35 years. And uh, everybody loved her. All right, Charlie, can you tell me when you started working for the Iron King Mine? I believe it was 19... 67, because I got married in 1960, so I was already working at the Iron King. And I worked there, I don't remember the date we went on strike. Anyway, when we went on strike, they fired us. So many of us, they fired us. And uh, that is when I had to leave Prescott, I went south. So I had a family. I had bills to pay. So I went south, and then they called us back. Okay, they've set up the strike, and it was wild. You know, it was a couple of months, maybe four or five months. We, uh, they called us back, and I think it was everybody. So I went back, and it wasn't the same thing. It wasn't the same Iron King I used to work for. They were really upset with us, and they had hired different guys, what they call scabs, to cross the line, and that's what we really hated. So then uh, they start shutting it down again. Uh, lack of ore. Uh, and all that. Copper, lead, zinc. They start laying us off again. I said, okay, I got laid off. I said, I ain't coming back here no more. Anyway, I don't like it anymore here. So that's when I went south. And then my first stop was in Superior. I had a brother, my, uh, an older brother than me, and he was a boss in Superior. He said, well, why don't you come over here and I'll get you the job. I said, okay. So I went down over there, and uh, I had already put applications different places. So this friend of mine, a compadre of mine, he told me, Charlie, you put an application here. They're going to hire you. Come over here right away. So then from Superior, I went to Miami. I was living in Miami. And then I went moved from Miami, I went to 
Globe. And there was a bus that take us from Globe to Christmas, called the Christmas Mine. There wasn't hardly any, any town, maybe a little convenience store. So I went to work there. And uh, it was so hot and dangerous. Oh my God, it was hot and dangerous. Very hot and dangerous. And that's when I was telling you earlier that they told me to go in there and bolt. So I'll quit. quit. I am not going to go in there and bolt. And my partner that told me to go over there told me, he said, Charlie, I'll go drill. You're crazy. His name was Zeke. You're crazy. That thing's going to cave in. As soon as you start drilling, it's going to cave in. No, it's not. I'm telling you, you're crazy. So, anyway, at lunchtime you had a tag. You pick it up and hang it over here. So we came and they asked me, uh, well, where's your partner? Oh, he's in there drilling. Well, usually when somebody's drilling, you can hear the vibration in the walls. He said, we don't hear him drilling. So can you take us to where he's at? Yeah. So I took him over there, took, I don't know, five, six guys. And as soon as we got close to him, I said, oh, my God, no, no. He was under there, the thing came down and killed him. It was a big, big boulder. What they did was they'd climb on top of it and they punch holes like this and blast it to break that big boulder to be able to get him out of there. And then after that, I said, I'm quitting here. So then I didn't quit right away. I start working there, and then I start uh, uh, drilling, and I broke this hand right here, this bone. And I said, that's it. I'm quitting. So then that's when I went uh, to Miami, where my wife was and my son, Charlie, he cried and cried because he was so sick. So I told her, you know what, pack up, we're moving, because they told us that he won't live another month. So she did. We didn't have very much there, but so we, she packed and I helped her and we moved back to Prescott. And I bet it was maybe two months he started feeling better. He started eating, he started eating. He was still a little baby. Yeah. And before you know it, he was really getting bigger and all that. So I said, well, he made it. So then I put my application in Baghdad. I never worked under uh, open pits, never. All underground. And I didn't like it there either. It was too dangerous. So anyway, I quit there. I don't think I was there six months, I quit. I quit, and I went to my wife. She was staying with her mother and with my kids. And I stayed there, I don't know, maybe a month, two months. And I said, I, I can't make no money here. I'm going back to mining. I'm going back to Baghdad. Well, if that's what you want, we wish you luck. So I went back there, and I stayed seven years. And I drive from Prescott to Baghdad. What was it, 75 miles, one way, and I had to go over there and back. And we worked three shifts, days, nine what we call, and then graveyard. And I used to drive by myself. So it was a long ways. And I worked very hard under there, very hard. And that's when me and my brother-in-law were drillers there the main drillers, and uh, we were on a big drill machine, and we could drill probably from here where your car's at, long steel. I could see, like in back of your car back there, boulders caving in, boulders caving in. I said, oh my God, I said, I hope it doesn't cave in and it blocks us. There's one way in and one way out. I said, I hope we don't get caved in because how are they going to find us here? Anyway, it finally stopped caving in. It's a small little hole. 
And my brother-in-law was a big man. And he said, well, I won't fit through that hole. I said, you go first. You make it. Go get help. I said, okay. I was afraid because it was KVN and it cracked me then. So I ran up the hill where all that boulders were. And I made it through there. And I yelled at him, Lupe, come on. You can make it. I know you can make it. Come on. So like I said, he was fat. And he did. And we both made it out of there. And that machine must have stayed there three weeks before they got it out of there. So that place started getting really, really bad. What happens is from one level, 100 foot, as you're coming up to the next level, that's when it really goes. Your walls, just like you get a cracker, smash them, that's the way the walls were. That's what's holding up that ore vein. So, oh my God, I said, it is really getting bad. So I told him, I said, you know what? I hope they shut this place down because it's going to kill somebody. And it's going to be somebody drilling. I said, and I hope it's not us. I hope it's nobody. So they finally shut it down. And they were sending miners all over the country. Chile, Bolivia, California, Utah, New Mexico, all over. And that's when he asked me, he said, they got an opening in Death Valley. I said, I ain't going to no Death Valley. I, uh, I'm quitting. Mining is over for me. I'm coming back to Prescott. So I came back to Prescott. And uh, this is where I retired. I said, no more mining for me. So I said, I'm glad I made it. But like I said, I saw some guys get killed, and it was awful. Awful to see these guys that got killed. Friends of mine. So what can you do? You know, you love mining. You want to go mining. They'd ask me, aren't you afraid to go down there? You know what? From the time we caught it, the, the cage, it's like an elevator. You get in there, and you get so many men in this cage, and then they drop you down to each level. And then you go back to work. So us, we used to eat our lunch before we go back there because there's no time. You had drilling to do. You had loading to do to be able to blast. So uh, that's what I did. And I said to myself, well, it's hard work, hard work. You can step in that cage. From the time you step in that cage, that cable that's hoisting you up and down can bust. And there goes that cage. It'll be like an accordion. It'll break. And what is the work that you did at Iron King? How oh, what? What is the work that you did at Iron King? Were you a driller? What was the worst thing, driller? Uh-huh. Yeah, drilling. I was drilling that Richard Alvarado, my compadre, he was my boss, and he told me, Charlie, I want you to go back there. I think it was like a 1900, and they were trying to start a new stove. And he said it, it was a lot more narrow than here. He said, you got to go over there and, and widen out so we can get in there. So I was drilling the, the foot wall. What they call a foot wall is the wall that comes down. The hanging wall is like this. And I'll tell you, I don't know how. I was looking over here where I was drilling, and by the corner of my eye, I see something like dark. I did not wait for nothing. I just let go of the machine. I started running back when I heard bang, bang, the walls came down. And if I wouldn't have seen that, I wouldn't be here today. It would have killed me. So that was one of the worst places that uh, I had to work. And they told me, him and this, they were putting up uh, lumber, timber. And he, said, he told me, compadre, he said, you look out back there where you're going to be drilling. We heard voices. We go back there, there's nobody there. But we heard these voices. And this guy that he was working, he was an old guy. He was an Italian guy. And he never messed around with nobody or kid around with nobody. And his name is Tony DePetris. I said, Tony, I said, tell me the truth. Did you guys hear somebody back there? 
Charlie, I'm going to tell you the truth. Yes, we heard somebody yelling for help, and we go back there, Richard, and now we go back there. There's nobody. So you be careful. I said, okay, thanks. So finally, they got everything widened it out, and they start putting their timber. It was 10 by 10s like this, and up here, down here. So we start working there, mining, and we finally start filling in to be able to be close to the top to drill. So this friend of mine, he was a real good friend of mine. His name was, uh, we called each other, a Marine. He was the next Marine, and I was the next sailor. And we were eating lunch from here to that helmet. And he asked me, Charlie, he said, where are you going to be for Thanksgiving dinner? And he talked real a funny voice, you know. I said, I, Marine, I said, I know where I'm going to eat. Do you know where you're going to eat? Oh, yeah, I know where I'm going to eat, Charlie. I said, okay, well, I hope so. So we finish our lunch, we go back there, and about 20 times we're ready to light about 50 holes. And we lit them by uh, uh, splitters. And once you start those other parts that you're filling, it gets so doggone smoky, you can't even see your hand in front of you. So... He said, okay, it's time to light up. I said, okay. He said, I'm going over this way, and you go this other way. And then we work together. So we start working. We hadn't even lit up yet. It was a good thing we didn't. So then I heard a bang. I turned around and, well, where is he? He was standing right here by me. Where is he? So I started walking back there, and I started yelling at him. And I looked down, there was these draws like this. And uh, I looked down there, and there he was, laying on his back. And what happened, that boulder that came down killed him instantly. So I started yelling for help down below. Start, guys started running up there to see what was it. As soon as they saw him, they turned around and took off running. No, we can't see this, we can't see this. I said, we got to get this guy out. we got to help. You guys got to help me. No, I can't do it. So this friend of mine told me, I'll get him from the legs, and you can get him from his arm and pull him to get him. We still have to get rock off of him. One of his arms looked like it had gone through a meat grinder. Oh, it looked awful. So I pulled him from the arm, and it looked like a nerve, but its thickness is a, is a cigarette. And they just stretched out. I said, oh, my God. So I told him, I can't. So he said, we'll get him, get him from underneath his shoulders. And that's how we picked him up. As soon as I saw him down there, I knew what had happened. He was bleeding through his mouth, nose, and ears. So I said, I know. And then his color changed. He was a white guy, but like a, like a sheet. Bled to death already. So we got him out. And he had a cut from his neck up here from the skull all the way down to the bottom, and it looked like it just got a sharp knife and just cut him. And he was open like this. You could see all his insides. Oh, my God. I said, oh, my God. I said, I hope I never, never see this again. So anyway, we got him out, and by that time, the boss had already come down, and we'd been telling him, this place is too dangerous put timber in there instead of open. No, we can't. We can't. I said, you have to. Somebody's going to end up getting killed. And sure enough, then he saw him there and he got a hold of him his shoulder. He started crying. The boss, he was an old guy. He started crying. He said, oh my God, I wish we would have put timber. Yeah, but now it's too late. So we had him in a basket. We took him down and took him, hoisted him outside. So I told him, and when we were going up the cage, I told him, you know what, don't ever ask me to go back down there, I won't go back. I was scared, afraid to go down there. He said, I won't. So he tried to one time, I said, no, remember what I told you, I'm not going down there. Oh, okay. So that was the end of that. Then I saw that Overa that got killed there too. Being, just to be 
how shall I say it, to go see. Oh, he was sitting down like this with a machine in this big boulder. It must have been about nine feet wide, probably as high as this ceiling. Just come down, fell right on top of him, and killed him instantly. Also, and that's how the Overa was. So those were the most awful things that I had ever seen. Was there a lot of Mexican mine workers then at the Iron King mine? Did I what? Were there a lot of Mexicans that worked at the Iron King? Yes. I bet there was mostly 85% Mexicans. They were coming from Mexico. Back then, they could, they'd hire all these Mexicans from Mexico. And they needed miners. They weren't even miners, but they hired. So it was a lot of Mexicans, yes. And then there was ones from here, from Prescott, of course, that was working there also. So they, uh, there was a lot of Mexicans. And they lived all around Prescott, the mayor, humble. They lived in, around there. It didn't matter where, as long as they could find a house to live. And um, how, I guess, what, you were then a driller at the Iron King. And uh, you told me that there, uh, I've heard from other miners that there was a locks, a coin system. That there was what? A coin system. A tag? A tag? Mm -hmm. As soon as you went in through the, through the shifter's office, they had a board like this wide, and they had these uh, rings. And when you went in there, you got your number and walked a little further, the ones that underground, and then you put your, your tag where you was going underground. When you come out of the underground, you get that pin again and put it that you're going out. So that way that you're, they know that you're out. They know that you're underground. So that's what they did. I, I had my, my pin, but I don't know what I ever did to it. And do you have a, uh, you had a lot of friends then at the Iron King? Friends? Uh-huh. <laughs> they were all my friends. <laughs> they were, we were all friends. And what did you guys do for fun? Uh, mostly once we get out of work, you know, you'd go home. But once you first, first got out, of, out, of course, you'd go to that Chemist bar or this Salby's bar. And we'd have maybe four or five beers there, and then everybody would get a six-pack, 12-pack, and then we'd go head towards Prescott, through Prescott Valley. And there was a tree and two or three garbage cans where you could throw your empty ones in there. And then uh, by that time, well, it's time for us to go home. So then we go home. And most of the time, we, for really for entertainment, we really didn't have much entertainment. You know, you just want to stay home, my wife, she worked. My kids were in school. So I didn't see them uh, say that I was working day shift. I didn't see them when I got off of work and see them. And they were too young, too little, ki little kids. So, but on my days off, we'd always do something. And, and uh, we, as they grew, started growing up older, I was making a lot of money. And so was my wife. We'd take off to Phoenix and go shopping. So that's what we used to do a lot. And did you ever attend the picnic, the Iron King picnic? The Iron King what? Picnic. The Iron King picnic. The picnic. Oh, yes. How yes. was that? Oh, that was really, really nice. It didn't matter if it was the Iron King or it was Baghdad. Baghdad was a better one. But they'd go... From Baghdad, they'd go up that Burroughs Creek, and they'd go and kill a, a burro, a donkey. And they'd bring him back, and they had pit, big pit. Of course, they'd peel him, gut him out and everything, and they put that burro down in that pit and barbecue him. I know that you've never ate a burro before. You could not even tell it was a donkey or a burro. Oh, it was good. And then the Mexicans, they're all from Mexico, you know. Oh, the salsas they'd make and everything else. Oh, and then burritos with corn tortilla. Oh, my God, it was just delicious. Yes, so at the Iron King, mostly they had beef, big chunks of beef, and they put it in the pit also. And uh, 
that make it, and all the families were there. Mexican, mostly Mexicans and white people were there. We'd have together, and then they have a lot of beer, a lot of beer to drink, kegs of beer. So, yeah, they were nice having those uh, uh, barbecues, mostly for Labor Day, Labor Day weekend. That's when they had those big barbecue things. And did you bring your whole family? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And um, I guess one of the last things that I want to ask you is, um, where was it? Oh yeah. Um, I guess in Prescott, where you lived here in Prescott, were there a lot of Mexican families, like Mexican American families? Yeah. She wants to know if there was a lot of people that lived in Prescott, Mexican people, your yeah. families. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then oh, what were some of the places where people ate? What were some of the things that they did for fun? I don't know if you remember. Uh, like I said, I don't remember. Oh, well, they had softball teams. Softball teams, and all the families would get together, and at the end, they'd maybe have three games. You know, and then they'd have a, a place where you could barbecue at, and then everybody would bring something, you know, uh, of course, and then what they used to barbecue. Dancing? Dancing? Oh, dancing. Yeah, had dances. Spook night? Spook night? Who? Spook night. At, and Jerome. Oh, and Jerome would go to Jerome. They call it Spook, they still have it, Spook night. And a lot of people from Jerome go there every uh, Spooks Nights, which is in uh, January, February, and October. October. I think it's in October. Halloween. And we have big dances over there, and we all get together. You see your, your old friends. Mostly they're all gone, too, because they're, the real old, old ones are dead. Like my first wife, uh, Kuka. Her father worked at the Jerome. Yeah. So I knew him uh, when I started. Uh, they, him, her father, and her mother used to go to Prescott, and they had an old truck with an old camper on the back. And he'd go all over uh, Sedona and he'd pick up uh, uh, fruits, chilies, watermelons, cantaloupes, and they'd go to Prescott and sell it. So I tell my kids when they're already grown up, I said, you know what? They like to come over here with a mom and dad, and they see all your toys. They're playing with your toys, this, playing with that. I said, and I'll stick my hand into that little windshield from that camper shell, and I'll grab something, I'll give it to you, I'll grab something, I'll give it to you. And uh, so that's what I did. Do you want to show us the photograph and talk a little bit about what you were doing there? What were you doing in that photo? This is what we're doing is we're filling. Like say you went uh, uh, 100 feet that way and you already took this ore body off and you got to start it again, another one. So you got to fill it from down here up almost to about uh, two feet from the surface. So then you can start drilling again and blasting and you go another 100 feet and you do go over again the same. Now this here where you see all that lumber and all that that I'm looking at, it, uh, there has to be two guys all the time. And then you got these boards that are about half inch thick and I don't know, they're about nine feet long and you got to stretch them out. One here, the next one, the next one, until you get 100 feet towards the end. They got to have two people there with you. You got a lifeline. And those hooks, those, that hook there, this here, they put a lifeline on you. Because if you, if you go, you're crawling over there. And if you're almost, to the two feet like this, you got to keep going and pouring. It's just like quicksand, water and real fine, fine stuff, just like quicksand. 
So you got to keep making sure that, that it's just like a little creek, that the water's running all the way back there to make sure that you're filling up the whole thing, see? So you, there's got to be two guys there and this lifeline. So if something happens, he'll pull you back. If you was to fall in there, they'd probably never find you. You'd never find you. So that's why they got this lifeline and they'll pull you. When they, you're finished at the end, then you say, okay, pull me back. You can't turn around. You got to pull you back out like this. So that's what we were doing here. And uh, it's scary. You know, they, my daughters and them asked me, didn't you get kind of being so close to the top and you can't stand up, you can't kneel down? Uh yeah, you kind of worry about it, but you know you have a safety belt for them to pull you back. So that's what this is, that picture and all that is. And what did you use that wrench for? The wrench? Uh-huh. That's what we used, uh, uh, a hammer. See this up here? It's already kind of wore out. Small stuff, like say if you're nailing stuff like here, then you can use it for a hammer. You don't wear no, you don't use hammers down there. You either use an axe about that long, and then you can really pound on it, pound on it. But this one here, when you're drilling, whatever you're doing, you need to, uh, you put in air holes, water holes, you gotta put them together. You gotta get, make sure that when you put them together, that you hit them hard, that they're not gonna come off. Because if you're on a big machine like I was, a big huge machine, those airlines were like this. And they got a safety chain you put on them. Because if that thing would ever come apart, you would never be able to stop it unless you go and turn the air off. Because that thing is whipping, man. It, it would hit you, it'd kill you. The pressure of air that's in there. So that's what we did, used to use this you could use this for a lot of things. And this one here, you probably use a little crescent wrench if you've got nuts you're tightening. That's what you use. And is that your helmet? Can you show us your helmet? This is my helmet. I tell you that I used to wear. This is my earplugs. Uh, and you can see my name, Charlie Reyes, and then I had Charlie Brown, what everybody called me, Charlie Brown. And you put your light, like you see there, your light there, you hook it on there, and then the cord, it comes back from here, and then you tie it down here. So it doesn't swing all over. So that's what that is for. And a lot of times, that light would go off before your eight hours were over. Sometimes it could go out like two hours after you went underground. So your partner would always tell you, uh-oh, you better go home. Why? That was an old saying. Why? They said when your light goes off, your wife is messing around. So everybody would just, you know, kid around and say, you better get home because your light is going. It's trying to tell you something. It, sometimes it would blink, blink, blink. Uh-oh. Messy, Charlie, you better go home. I said, I don't have to worry about that. But if you're around wherever, you don't have this light, you can't see nothing. Nothing, not your hand in front of you. Because it's so dark. I mean, it's so dark underground. I mean, dark, dark. So uh, you better hope that somebody's around. And there's always somebody else that's working, like putting track for your or cars and stuff like that, uh, and ventilation pipes, water lines. So there's always somebody around to help you. But like where that Olvera got killed, way, way back there. Uh, I went over there because they call it a, a loading stick, blasting stick. It could be like nine feet long. It's only about that wide. And what you do is, Go find one and get maybe two, three sticks of dynamite and tie it up. And then what you do, 
you light it and you stick it up the chutes. Where it was hung up by the rocks, they come together and hung it up. And what you was trying to do, spring it down. So that's what you do. So I went back there and I saw where he would gotten killed. My hair in the back just like stuck up and I said, oh my God. I couldn't even turn around and walk back down. I had to climb backwards. And I said, oh my God. And uh, finally I got back and I, I got to go I, a long ways to where my partner was. And I kept looking back, kept looking back to see if I'd see somebody coming from behind me. I said, maybe it was his spirit or something, but it wasn't. I heard a lot of guys say that they saw lights, like way back there, not just there, different places. And you got your, your light, you make a signal, round and round, come here. And if you're shaking your head, get back, stay away, you're going to blast, stay back. So I knew this one guy, and he'd go with him. Saw this guy way back there, and he kept going closer, closer, closer. And before you knew it, there was a cross, what, what they call a cross, that you'd go in there where the trains go in there, and he was back here, and he come back down, and he'd go in there. Why didn't he come to me and talk to me? One of the spirits of people that got killed. Spooky things that happened, spooky things. Sometimes they tell you, I want you to go down to a certain level by yourself. Check those pumps. Oh, my God. Please don't send me down there. I don't want to go down there. It's too far down there that I have to go by myself. I'm always turning around, conscious. You know. 